So most people, uh, thanks to last week's show, now know what a special master is and their job and the role of a special master. Won't get back into that. But the significant news is that the judge, Judge Cannon in the Southern District of Florida, ruled to allow a special master to come in. Big ruling. But in my opinion, it totally follows the law and is warranted by the circumstances. As Judge Cannon's order on a special master puts forth more succinctly than I'll be able to say, she basically says this case is so unique, it involves a former president, and it also involves such high-level legal issues, executive privilege, the the, uh, attorney-client privilege, personal records, all of these things, she said, have to be done above board. That's why I'm bringing in a special master. And she also had some harsh things to say about the DOJ and their handling and their execution of not just the search warrant itself, but how they went about uh, raiding Mar-a-Lago and what they took. That's actually very interesting in itself that she kind of goes into some detail and says, you know, there's there's things that were seized that, you know, are suspect, I guess. Yeah. So one, 40 plus years of medical records, it looks like. Two, tax documents, three, attorney-client privilege information, four, executive privilege information. And if you can believe it, they took clothing. Um, And so the judge, I think rightfully so, has come in and said, you know, search warrants pursuant to the FBI's own operating manual are supposed to be conducted in the least intrusive manner when authorized because a search warrant is, by its definition, an invasion of someone's privacy. Um, And so the FBI is trained to do it without sort of going in there like you see in the movies and breaking glass and throwing people down to the ground. They're supposed to do it professionally and smartly. And what the judge is saying, you guys didn't do that. And if that wasn't bad enough, she's basically uh, told the world that the DOJ should have done a better job, not just the FBI. The DOJ took all this stuff and didn't necessarily inform the court directly that it had taken executive privilege materials and attorney-client privilege materials, and materials that are personal to the President of the United States, or President Trump, that is. Last week, we went over what a taint team is, you know, the separate walled-off group of individuals who have nothing to do with the subject matter of the case, but are reviewing all the other stuff the FBI collected at Mar-a-Lago, and they're supposed to be doing it because it's supposed to be an above-board operation. Well, the judge basically said, why didn't the taint team um, turn this material back over to President Trump, it has absolutely nothing to do with the search warrant. It has nothing to do with the alleged crimes that are outlined by the FBI and DOJ in the search warrant. And so basically what the judge is saying is, I, as an Article Three court officer, the judge, do not trust you, the FBI and DOJ, based on your own conduct and based upon the warrants uh, that you applied for and executed. That is a shocking revelation and a shocking sort of dart that the judge is throwing at them. But I think it speaks to the truth, Jan, that what we've been talking about, that this entire operation was politicized from the beginning. And anybody that used to be a former federal prosecutor like myself knows that there was a hundred different ways to handle this. Not going in there and taking grandmother's pearls and everything else, having an actual taint team that is walled off that returns property that should never have been seized in the first place. And so now the judge is going to be on this with a keen eye, as if she already wasn't. And I think uh, what will happen in the coming days is that both sides, the Department of Justice and President Trump's team, will recommend special masters they feel are up to the task. And the judge doesn't necessarily have to go with those picks, but I think it's the appropriate step because what she's saying is, hey, you guys should be allowed to participate in this conversation of a special master. Let me know what your thoughts are. And it'll be very telling to see what both sides come up with. Are they going to come up with politicized hacks? Are they going to come up with people who have historic backgrounds in prosecutions, in national security cases, in types of matters of high sensitivity? We'll see. But um, I think you mentioned something about, you know, the, uh, the, the, the birds chirping in the fake news media about this as well. Let me ask you this, okay? So one of the theories that I've heard about the whole Russiagate fiasco is that, you know, basically when these investigations were begun and, you know, they knew very, very early on that, you know, there, there was really nothing there, right? That it was kind of a f- actually fishing expedition, that they were sure in their minds that they would find something if they dig enough, right? Sort of picking up all this material that, that seems to be uh, unnecessary makes me think of that, actually, a kind of, kind of a fishing expedition. What do you think? Well, look, I've said that from the beginning. 
that all roads lead to Russiagate. And I've said that because we've proven it over and over and over again. Be it the same corrupt government gangsters at the FBI who did Russiagate, who did Hunter Biden impeachment one, or excuse me, be it the same government gangsters at the FBI and DOJ that authorized the Russiagate investigation, or were involved in Hunter Biden's laptop, or were involved in the impeachment fiasco, or were involved in now the raid. You see the same figures, i.e. Tybalt and company, coming up over and over again. And when you, you know, we covered this extensively in a previous episode, so I won't dive into it, but the Russiagate documents that President Trump declassified, how we've told the world that Devin and I only were able to get out about 60% of our investigation, so 40% was left, and some of it's the most damning information of corruption um, at the FBI and DOJ during Russiagate. So we've, we've talked about the FBI and DOJ's impetus in doing this raid. Maybe they thought those documents were down there. I have no idea. I found out about the documents being at Mar-a-Lago when the world did. But I think what you're talking to is that these people are so scared that the rest of the corruption might be exposed from Russiagate six years ago. And the bigger story is that they've allowed it. They, Chris Ray and Merrick Garland, have allowed it to be hidden from the American public by sort of igniting and weaponizing the law enforcement and intelligence apparatus of the United States of America, which is, of course, what happened in Russiagate. Um, and we come full circle. So we're going to need to see those documents. And I hope this judge uh, works with this special master to give back to President Trump what he should have and also publicize to the world when it's shown DOJ and FBI acted unlawfully, unethically and further corrupted our law enforcement agency. Is it possible to have an entirely impartial special master in the context of such a highly politicized reality? Yes, it is. And you know, people joked about it on Truth Social, and I think half of them were somewhat serious. They were like, Cash, you should be the special master. You know, I'm probably not the ideal candidate um, for this one because I have the ability to tell the world that I might have some bias that I can't put aside. But there are individuals out there. I know I, know I did it every day when I served as a DOJ prosecutor or as a p public defender or another high-level government official. You have to put aside your biases. That's what your oath says. That's what that's demanded of you in government service. And there are still individuals out there who I think can do that. Um, I'm not going to go out and name names yet and get ahead of it. But I think we should look at the people doing the attacks uh, of the special master. Again, we see the likes of Andrew Weissman coming in and somehow saying he making a self-declaration that he knows about the law better than anyone else. And let me remind our audience, Andrew Weissman was overturned by the United States Supreme Court nine to zero in his prosecutions involving Arthur Anderson and Enron. Not five and four, not six and three, not seven and two, not eight and one, nine to zero. And they stunningly reversed those convictions of Andrew Weissman when he was at DOJ because they said he basically acted unlawfully, unethically, and violated due process. This man is coming out and leading the fake news charge that they are somehow surprised and disappointed that a special master was uh, appointed, even though we've already just outlined so many reasons why the judge lawfully and correctly made that decision. So I encourage our audience to, you know, when you see the naysayers and say, oh my God, I'm shocked, it's not a coincidence that they all happen to be people who are involved with hating Trump from day one and or involved with the corrupt practices of the FBI and DOJ that Devin and I exposed during Russiagate. You would think that they may just kind of lie low, you know, in this sort of situation. You know, Jan, that would be the smart play from them because it's not like this judge doesn't see the media and read about it. She's very informed. And what they can't resist is the same temptation that the FBI can't resist. It's their own arrogance.